I'm Cheryl Olson. My, I was an Esslinger when I was um, born, but I met Larry when I was in junior high school, and uh, we became, you know, good, good friends. And um, he was always wanting to be out in the desert, which you probably already know about. And so most of our dates were going out into the desert and hunting arrowheads, going through caves. Um, just having picnics and doing stuff, you know. And uh, he, I was, I had had some background in in the out of doors. My father was a hunter and fisherman, but we did it the easy way. We took the camper on his pickup and uh, cooked on a grills and had you know, wonderful food. With Larry, it was just so fun doing it. Just by the seat of your pants, going out there and seeing what there is, what you can find, what you can do. So, you are also an instructor Yes. in the field, though. Tell me a little bit about that. Okay. Um, after we had about eight kids, um, and we'd both been doing a lot of wilderness things, when he started uh, going out and taking groups, we had a teepee, and we took the teepee with us, and I took all the kids, and camped at the, the base camp for the summer. So the children and I were very comfortable in the outdoors. Um, after Larry started um, Anasazi, when he was ready to start Anasazi, and had, we had things set up, I went with him searching out areas and making decisions and just being a part of it. But um, it was time for the first course to begin. We had six students lined up but he didn't have a female instructor. He had a couple of males. Well, two of them were our sons, who were teenagers, and another man. And, and uh, we, he asked several of the women that had worked a little bit on the trail in the past, and no one wanted to do it or wasn't able to do it anymore. And the kids, our kids said, Mom, why don't you go? And I said, well, um, I'm really comfortable in the outdoors. I'm not afraid of anything. I, it would be a wonderful thing to do, but what would we do with the kids? Because we still had some young ones at home. And, and they said, well, Dad can take care of it. And the reason they said that was because he had been in a bad car accident a couple of years before and uh, just pretty much uh, messed up his leg and he wasn't at that time able to do the trail. So he was just going to be the backup person, and that made it so he could watch over the younger kids as well. So I went, and it was a 44-day um, course. We were in, in Arizona, but it was November, and December, and January. It got really cold. It was a challenge for me, but I had just learned how to be innovative and accepting of the wilderness. And we had some wonderful young people, and I was just so thrilled to be able to be out there with them, getting to be close with them, helping them to do what they had to do there. And it was a pinnacle experience. Do you remember some of the things that you taught them out there in the field? Um, yes. Uh, building a fire without matches with the bow drill, uh, cooking on the campfire. Um, how to have a warm bed, uh, how to be accepting of whatever was going on. Um, one of the things that I hoped that they would go home with was an attitude that I related to the story of uh, uh, Brer Rabbit. What? No. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, uh, well, um, what was his name? Uncle, Uncle Remus. Remus. Mm -hmm. And. Um, the laughing place, mm -hmm. and that had to do with leading their enemies that were trying to beat them up to a place where there was a hornet's nest, mm -hmm. and they ruffled the hornets, and then they chased their enemies away, and, and so he used that as his story of his laughing place, mm -hmm. and, and he, he got them to go there with him because he told, told them that it was a laughing place. Well, what I did was think of a memory place. I had myself had an experience just sitting up on a ledge above, a, above the Verde River, 
looking down on the students who are down there um, just washing their clothes, getting water out of the creek, looking around, just, and they were laughing and enjoying themselves. There was a breeze blowing, this beautiful brush along the river was just blowing, and there were birds singing. The sun felt like it was just penetrating into my very soul, and I just couldn't have been a happier person and thrilled to be there. So I would tell, tell the young people about this and, and challenge them to watch for those kinds of experiences when they just have the very most confident, happy, um, satisfying feelings. And the invitation was to go home, and when things started getting a little rough for them, go find a quiet place, whatever it had to be, at the city park or wherever, and sit down by a tree and just lean back and close their eyes and imagine that they were in that place. And remember the resolutions that you made, the feelings, the things that they learned. And I had a lot of good feedback from those young people that, that in fact, they put, put this little idea into one of the manuals for the students to go out with. At that beginning time, I, I'm calling them students because uh, that was what we did. But after Ezekiel and Pauline joined us and we started using more of the uh, Native American terminology and, and philosophy, uh, young walkers came out of that. that so I was a trail walker of Eden when they first came out. Um, there was one of the young women that went out uh, on the second course and I had become a shadow by then. I would go out once a week and uh, sit with them and then go back to town and visit her with her parents and help them to kind of know what each other was thinking and doing. But um, she had been in, in a really bad lockup facility that was really hard on her. she got and then she just threw up her arms she says I'm free and she never had that thing before because we were accepting her and she was accepting us that's what I cherish about that experience we had a lot of rain we had kites we had to go across the water river cold nearly freezing us but, uh, but I've been prepared for it and it, it gave me just such a satisfaction and now some of then our own children went to work on the trail also. And so it really has been a family. I was a part of it as much as I could and still raised ten children. And we've got the most wonderful children in the world, I think. Um, poison Ivy off of a trail mm -hmm. that we were going down. Um, he was taking me to this cave in the canyon. And he'd been there before, and he had walked through the, the poison ivy, and it hadn't bothered him. But he had a machete, and he thought, well, I should, you know, clear this. So he hacked it all out so I could walk through without touching a thing. And even uh, within the next few days, he just started coming out with a horrible poison ivy attack. And it lasted a lot. And he describes it. It was and he says, but Cheryl didn't have to fuss with that at all because I, <laughs> because I took such good care of her. <laughs> and, and then there's a picture of, that we took, and I was standing holding the machete in front of this before he started mm -hmm. cutting it. So, and it's just, I, I don't know, to me that adds a fun dimension to the whole uh, it kind of experience. Yeah. So, so tell me about the rattlesnake. One day, Larry and I were out in the desert hiking along at the top ridge of a canyon, and we came across a rattlesnake. It was all coiled up, and, and uh, but then it ran, it left, and it fell down a creek and a crevice, 
and we looked over the edge and saw that it was, uh, it was a, a place down there where it was, it was a over, overhang. And Larry wanted to kill that snake, so he got down uh, uh, along the side and got down there, but when he arrived there was no, no weapon at all, only small pebbles on the ground. So he asked me to drop a rock down to him. And I, I found one that I thought might kill a rattlesnake, and I tossed it over to him. And he, when he caught it, he reports that he said that that was the perfect time. He says, I love that girl. Uh, but then he decided he should have a, another rock in case that one missed. So he had me spin down another one, and I did. And he took aim, and the snake was ready to strike. And it, he just splattered it all over the rock. Instantly. Uh, so then he picked it up and worked his way back up to where I was and bought the snake. And he just reached out and handed it to me. And and I just took it and just kind of held it out to the side. And we started walking along. And then all of a sudden it just started writhing around and up and down and wiggling. And, and I couldn't figure out what was going on, but I just was watching. And he said that his thought in that moment was that I was going to throw it down and scream and run and have a fit. Because that's what he thought most girls would do. But I didn't. And he stepped on over and he started looking at it. And it had two bulges in its length. And um, he said it probably is mice. So we just kept watching. And as it wiggled around, or he got him worked down and it fell right out through his mouth. And he threw up two mouth bodies. Mm -hmm. And Larry said, it was right then that I decided that I was going to marry her. He said, um, she, she was finding that to be an adventure in the same way I was. <laughs> the Primitivus Project is made possible by the generous sponsorship of Wingate Wilderness Therapy. Wingate Wilderness Therapy is a premier wilderness therapy program for troubled teens and young adults that offers hope and healing. Designed for both troubled teens and young adults, Wingate offers two distinctly separate wilderness programs addressing the needs of two very different age groups. Wingate operates from the understanding that change comes from the inside out, not the outside in. To learn more about Wingate, visit WingateWildernessTherapy.com or call 1-800-560-1599. Please subscribe to this channel to ensure you don't miss any episodes of the project. New videos will be loaded every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Please like the videos and share them with your friends. Thanks for watching and I'll see you on the trail.